particularly downstairs. And he's been a postdoc for about two and a half years, and then recently just came on as a uh, scientist staff with them. So I'm kind of in the, let's call it the climate group. Um, and in particular, I'm really interested in the ocean and I'm an oceanographer. Um, so getting involved in GCAM and integrated assessment is a whole kind of new field for me. So um, today I'm going to be talking about how we can model the climate. So you guys have already spoken about water, you spoke about agriculture. Um, and, and so how do those things play a role in the climate? And how does the climate feed back on them? And how do they feed back on the climate? So we'll start with, is it weather or is it climate? Um, so here's a few bubbles. It's a beautiful day out today in Maryland. Weather or climate? Weather. Weather, all right. Um, should I bring sunscreen to Miami? <laughs> weather or climate? Climate. Climate, awesome. Where should we go skiing this winter? Weather or climate? Climate. Climate, okay. So awesome. So um, the, the idea is that the weather are the conditions at a particular time and place. So what it's doing right now in Maryland. Um, the climate though is a long-term average. So climate patterns, long-term average of this weather. So it's gonna be warm in Miami, you're gonna have seasons in, in Maryland. And so that would kind of be your climate. Is it, is it hot, is it cold, is it wet, is it dry? So what are the some of the things that can influence the climate? Um, changes in the sun's output, so different changes in solar radiation, um, sunspots, things like the Earth's orbit or drifting continents can change the climate. But these are on geological time scales, so thousands to millions of years. Um, more in our lifetime, we have some volcanic eruptions and they can uh, change the climate. Um, these are short-lived, only maybe a few years after volcanic eruption, and they'll typically cool the planet. Uh, then we also have greenhouse gases, and so for the rest of the time we'll be talking about greenhouse gases. Um, and so we're currently changing the amount of greenhouse gases that are present in the atmosphere. Um, and so hopefully this is a repeat for a lot of you, but I wasn't quite sure what your background was, so I decided I'd go into, into kind of climate change. Um, so what is the greenhouse Oops, effect? Um, so the idea is that radiation from the sun comes to the planet's surface. Um, and it warms the temperature of the Earth above what it would be if there was no atmosphere. Um, so we have our incoming solar radiation, um, and it, it's incoming as shortwave radiation. It bounces off the land, or let's say clouds, or out of the atmosphere, um, as long wave or heated, like thermal, um, infrared thermal radiation. And so some of the things that can influence the, uh, the greenhouse effect or are these are things called greenhouse gases. So for instance, carbon dioxide, water, methane, N2O, SF6. Um, and so without these gases in the atmosphere, the Earth would be a chilly negative 19 degrees Celsius. And so um, it's because of the presence of these gases that we are allowed, that we can inhabit the Earth. Um, so currently humans were influencing the climate system. Um, and so human activities are increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases from industrial energy emissions, deforestation, agriculture. These all change the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So here's a, a figure of atmospheric CO2 measurements from about 1955 to uh, 1958 to 2015. And so we can see that um, atmospheric CO2 levels are like on a logarithmic increase over the last 50 years or so. Um, if we kind of zoom in a little bit, and what I find interesting is that this is a, the seasonality of CO2. Um, and so this is taken from the Northern Hemisphere, so from Hawaii. And um, you have, uh, as, as trees grow, they'll, uh, they'll respire out CO2. Um, and then as the, as the leaves, oh, right, yeah. They, 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 take in, they, they take in CO2 when they grow and then they respire CO2 as, they, as the leaves fall off the trees. Um, so you end up with this, this seasonal cycle um, on top of the general trend. Uh, and so increasing these greenhouse gases trap more heat. So here's our greenhouse gases. You have your incoming radiation um, and now we're, we're changing that cycle. We can't, there's not a lot of, the, the radiation isn't escaping out to space like it was before and being trapped by the atmosphere. Um, so primarily I've been talking about carbon dioxide, let's say. And so that plays a role in the Earth's carbon cycle. 
So carbon cycles between the ocean, the land, and the atmosphere. Um, so we're taking this stored carbon um, and we're emitting it as fossil fuels. It enters the atmosphere um, and it, it'll, some of the ocean will absorb the CO2 um, and it could be converted into oceanic sediments. Um, it plays a role in, in, your, um, in the circulation of carbon via um, you know, fish and uh, aquatic biomass. Um, you end up with uh, changes in forests, uh, biomass deforestation, afforestation. Um, and so, so the carbon cycle plays, uh, so the, the carbon cycle essentially, we cycle carbon throughout all of these systems. Um, and so one of the, the neat things in GCAM is we can kind of pull apart all of these systems and really look at what CO2 is doing um, within each of these section, sections or the greenhouse gases. So now we have a kind of a basic understanding of the climate system. Um, how, can, how do we scientists model the climate? So what are the ways in which we can model all of these feedbacks in the climate system? Um, so I'm going to be talking about essentially four different climate models. Um, the first, energy balance models, simple climate models, models of intermediate complexity, and then Earth system models. And so this is a nice graph that shows the, um, the interaction of components between each other, um, the dimensions, um, and then the spatial scale. So essentially, a simple model will have a lot of interacting components. Um, but it's not going to have many dimensions. It'll just have kind of one or two dimensions. Um, as we get up to Earth system models or atmospheric, ocean, general circulation models, um, they're going to have a lot of interacting components. Um, they're going to have uh, a lot of interacting components on a lot of dimensions. Um, and so, so for example, you have you know grid cells in these in these models that go vertical through the atmosphere. Um, and they're calculating all of these processes. They also go with depth, uh, calculating all of these processes. And then all of these grid cells are interacting with each other. So you end up with a highly complex, highly integrated um, uh, Earth system model. Um, and then down here is where you'd find your simple climate models, models of intermediate complexity, energy balance models. Um, and so we can do all sorts of different things using the different models, yeah. That's not a stupid question, but can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by dimensions? Like, sure. Is it like like layers of the atmosphere? Is that or, um, or the ocean? So the um, so you can have dimensions. Are you sure I can write on this? It's not gonna yes. <laughs> um, I feel like a kid. So here's your uh, so dimensions. You could have um, um, why am I drawing a blank? Latitude. Yeah, latitude, longitude. Okay, so here's one dimension, here's a second dimension. We can also go up vertically into the atmosphere. Um, uh, so that's one, two, this would be a third dimension. We can go down into the ocean. Uh, that would be a fourth dimension. Um, and then we have all of these dimensions, all of these dimensions um, acting in time. Um, so you end up with a lot long, a, an atmosphere, an ocean, and a time point. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's highly intensive to calculate all of those grid cells at all of those dimensions mm -hmm. at every time step. Um, and so, so that's what I mean by the dimensions and how those dimensions then interact um, would be kind of your, your Earth system models. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's cool. very good. Thank you. That was really cool. <laughs> I'm all um, so I'll just give a little background of some of the models. Um, and an energy balance model is kind of your simplest idea. And again, if we, if we think about the climate system, it's the amount of radiation entering the Earth and it's the amount of radiation leaving the Earth. Um, so any, kind of, any change in that radiation balance is essentially your energy balance model. Um, some can get a little more sophisticated and they can be broken up into latitudinal bands. Um, so you'll have different incoming solar radiation at different latitudes, um, and then again you'll have different radiation exiting the, uh, at those latitudinal bands. Um, super simple, you're only really just calculating that transfer of energy. Um, 
moving on to simple climate models. Um, they have a low resolution, but they're a little bit more complex. They have more interacting components. They have simple physical and chemical react, uh, representations of the Earth system. So for example, this is Hector, a model that I've been developing over the last few years. Um, and so it, the ocean has, um, in, it would have two dimensions, kind of on the surface. You have a high and a low latitude, and then we have a, a depth dimension. Um, in the land, we have, it's just one global box, but it, can, but it has multiple layers, so, so mm -hmm. it's a depth dimension. Um, and then the atmosphere is just one well-mixed box. And the arrows represent the flow of carbon between all of the boxes. And so we can calculate things, we can get a little bit more in depth into the carbon cycle. Um, we can look at changes in the carbon in the ocean, changes in carbon in land, so net primary production, heterotrophic respiration, um, things like that. We also have some atmospheric chemistry uh, in the, obviously in the atmosphere. Um, so we're not just calculating radiative balances, we're calculating concentrations of, of CO2, methane, black carbon, organic carbon, halocarbons. Um, there's a ton of atmospheric uh, components that we have going into the atmosphere. So one of the key things about simple climate models is that they, they can run a hundred year time period in a matter of seconds. Um, so we can run these a lot uh, and, and get a lot of information very quickly. Now, intermediate complexity models, they have more process representations. So they'll have more detailed atmospheric chemistry. Like things like precipitation, you'll have detailed ocean circulation, so thermal halion circulation. Um, their coarse resolution, so it's a three by three. So again, we have like each, each lat long box would be, um, would be three degrees. Um, and so they take, to run 100 years, they take about 10 hours to run. So not too long, but long enough that you can't just generate that in, in, in a few seconds um, and get some plots out. But you get a lot more information. Again, you can look at um, uh, the interaction of clouds and aerosols, um, precipitation, nutrients, um, different atmospheric circulation. You kind of start to set up something here where you have both uh, depth, atmospheric, uh, dimensions, ocean dimensions, and then and then uh, Latin long dimensions. And so the big models are these Earth system models or atmosphere ocean general circulation models or general circulation models. So I may use all of these terms interchangeable. They they roughly mean the same thing. So here's our Earth system. And so what the Earth system models do is they integrate all of these interactions between the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, ice, let's say sea ice or ice sheets, um, and the biosphere. And we can estimate regional and global climate under a wide range of different uh, climate conditions. So all of these are interacting with each other. Um, the aerosols and how they relate to clouds, um, the, how greenhouse gases relate to the physical climate, Greenhouse gases and ecosystems. Again, kind of if you have more CO2, your plants want to grow more. So it's something called CO2 fertilization. Um, so you'll have changes in the ecosystems um, in agriculture. Um, we have, um, you have cities. Uh, cities give off a lot of emissions. Maybe they have methane and ozone. Um, so all of these things kind of interact with each other in these earth system models. So they're really powerful tools and we can get a lot of information out of them. And all of these interactions are happening within each grid cell via depth and, and altitude. Um, so our current set of these Earth system models, they're at about 0.5 degree resolution. Um, and uh, whereas the, the intermediate complexity models are at about three degree resolution. So, the atmosphere roughly maybe about 40 layers, the ocean about 20 uh, layers. And so to run all of this, so you have interactions at every, uh, every depth and every altitude interacting with each other up and down and back and forth. Um, and so all of these interactions are happening with all, within all of these grid cells. So with that, it takes to run 100 years worth of climate, it takes 
a few days to several months to run this data. Um, so you really have to know your plan of attack before you can really dive into these Earth system models and run them. Um, so that's why a lot of the big centers like GFDL and NCAR, um, they're the ones kind of in charge of these big models. Like we wouldn't necessarily be running these big models because they're very computationally expensive. Uh, okay, so how do we look at, um, what are about some projections of future climate change? So now we know what climate change is, we know um, how we can, how we can uh, model climate change, and then what are our projections for future climate change? So this is a figure from the IPCC report. Um, and we have change in surface temperature and change in precipitation. This would kind of be an unmitigated scenario, and here you have a highly mitigated scenario. And so we see that under, under a business as usual or a non-mitigated scenario, that global temperature changes, uh, or the, 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 the delta in global temperature change, in the Arctic, we can have up to a 9, 10, 11 degree Celsius change that they're project, predicted, or projecting out at 2100. Um, and then we can have up to 50% difference in precipitation, let's say, in the Arctic. Okay. So where do these, um, so this is something called RCP26 and RCP85. Have, have you heard of representative concentration pathways and the RCPs? You guys are familiar with that? All right, um, so they describe four, four possible climate futures. Uh, so here's a radiative forcing <laughs> in watts per year squared, and here's uh, time on the bottom. And so they're named after the radiative forcing values in 2100. So an RCP 26 here in green is that it's the radiative forcing will be 2.6 in 2100. And the same for 85, 4, 5, 6. Um, and so we, the Earth system models, these big, big models, use the RCPs as inputs, and then they'll study the climate system. And we'll, we'll see how the climate then responds under four different scenarios. Um, but so where did those, so in order to calculate the radiative forcing, um, we need the greenhouse gases in order to calculate the radiative forcing. So where did these greenhouse gas concentrations come from? How did these RCPs get them? And then how did the climate models, um, uh, you know, get the RC, or how, how, where, did the, where did the greenhouse gas concentrations come from to calculate the RCPs? Um, so there's four, uh, four uh, integrated assessment groups that are responsible for the four RCPs. Um, in particular, RCP 4 and 5 <coughs> was calculated by a version of GCAM called Minicam. Um, and it's essentially like a more simplified GCAM. Um, so what these what these integrated assessment models, message, aim, minicam, image, what they did was they wanted to find suitable emissions pathways um, that when they were converted to concentrations, reach a particular radiative target. So here's our concentration of CO2, and here's year. Um, and so uh, RCP85, where is Minicam in purple here? This is the 4 5 scenario. So these are the concentrations that result in a radiative forcing of 4.5 watts per year squared. So these four modeling groups picked, found suitable uh, emissions pathways um, that led to the RCPs, that then led to these big climate models um, using that information. Um, so I thought it was really interesting that the whole process started with integrated assessment models. Um, so I'm sure you've seen this figure <laughs> plenty of times, probably in every class. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the climate system here on the side. So we have all of these systems or sectors feeding into the climate system. So we have feedbacks between the human and the earth systems. So here's, let's say, socioeconomics, energy, land, water. Um, they feed into climate and climate feeds into them. So if we think about Muhammad and the water resources, um, if we have changes in precipitation, you're gonna have changes in water availability. That's gonna affect your agriculture, your crops, your water 
usage for, uh, for energy. Um, so anthropogenic emissions affect the climate system. They change radio forcing, change temperature, change precipitation, and then for example, they can also change sea level rise. Then changes in the climate, in particular temperature and precipitation, which I'll simplify just as T and P, um, they can change the water supply and demand, they can change agriculture, they can change the energy demand, um, and so then all of these all affect the socioeconomic, so income, GDP, population. Again, if you have no water, um, it's going to be hard to, to grow your population, feed your people. Um, so the human and the earth system are really tightly coupled together. So to really investigate this, this, these, these feedbacks between the climate and the human systems, um, we typically use simple climate models. So we had an energy balance model, a simple climate model, um, integrated or uh, intermediate complexity model, and then an Earth system model. So most of the integrated assessment models use these simple climate models. Again, we can run 100 years within seconds. Um, and it can run on all of your laptops and really quickly. Um, you could probably teach your moms how to, how to run these simple climate models. Um, so some of the strengths of a simple climate model is that they can be fast executed. Again, they're easy to use. Um, you can have many runs. You can run them 10,000 times. Uh, if it only takes a few seconds, that's 10,000 seconds. Um, they can be calibrated against the more complex models. We can make them look like those large-scale Earth system models with all of this complexity. Simple climate models we can use for probability and uncertainty analyses. Um, we can also use them to kind of test things out. So what if we do this? How will the, how will the climate change? Um, you can't do that with an Earth system model. You can't just say, hey, what if I want to see how, it would take you months to get your answer, and your answer was, wasn't what you wanted in the first place. So, so this is why we use a simple climate model. Um, a lot of the integrated assessment models use a simple climate model called MAGIC. Um, this is the model for assessment of greenhouse gas induced climate change. Um, MA, greenhouse gas, so it's been instrumental in the IPCC. So that's what, what uh, the model that the, the IAMs used to get those radiative forcing, so those RCPs. The problem with MAGIC, it's not open source. So we, we don't have access to the code. It's really hard to get access to the code. I mean, it's not well documented. So if we want to go in and change anything, I mean, it becomes a little bit problematic. So, over the last five years or so, Jigri decided, you know what, we're going to build our own model. Um, rather than link GCAM to MAGIC, we're going to start from, we're going to start fresh, and we're going to build a new model called Hector. And so this is what I've been doing for, for the last three years, is developing this simple climate model. And so it's open source. Um, anyone can use it. Anyone can download it. There's no restrictions. Um, it's well documented uh, with papers and online. And we're hoping to make it a community model. So if there's something that you're really interested in working on, you can go ahead and download Hector at github.com and you can make your own component and add it into Hector. Um, and so we're really pushing this idea of like, of, the, of a community model. And this is something you can't do with magic. So we're hoping in the future that uh, Hector can not, not really replace magic, but can work alongside of it. And we can compare multiple simple climate models together, just like we compare multiple Earth system models together. So why is it called Hector? Um, so Ben was working when he first started working on it. He Ben von Lamberty, one of our, our scientists, uh, uh, he was reading the Iliad, and <laughs> he, he just picked Hector. We tried to have a competition at work to pick who could come up with the best name, <laughs> um, but uh, no one no one won that. So we just decided to keep it as Hector. Hmm. Uh, um, and we've since published it, so I think it's looking like Hector. Is. Hector it is. So, uh, uh, so the simple climate model, it'll take in emissions. Um, so here's all our different emissions pathways. It converts those emissions to concentrations. Um, and this is where we end up with our, with our carbon cycle coming into play. So you need to know how much the oceans are taking up. You need to know how, how much the biosphere is taking up uh, in order to convert the emissions to concentrations. The concentrations then get converted to radiative forcing. And then radiative forcing feeds into our climate response, so in particular temperature. Um, 
So this is a series of steps that have to take place in these simple climate models. So here's a set of GCAM emissions that come out of GCAM. Uh, CO2, methane, N2O, a ton of uh, halo carbons, uh, like CFCs, um, things like that, uh, aerosols, black carbon, organic carbon. And so we, we calculate CO2 from fossil fuel and industry um, as well as land use. And so all of these emissions go into this first stage of the simple climate model. Um, so then it takes in these, in, in, like I said, it takes in these emissions and converts them to concentrations within this, and, but this carbon cycle really plays a role in that step. Once we calculate the concentrations, then we use them to calculate radiative forcing. So I just pulled out how to calculate, how we calculate the radiative forcing of CO2. Um, it's essentially the, the, the natural log of the, um, the initial concentration of CO2 versus our concentration of CO2 that we're calculating here. That gives us a radiative forcing. Um, so then the radiative forcing is then used to calculate the, the temperature change. And so the temperature, surface temperature change is related to how sensitive the climate is times the uh, radiative forcing. So something that the, um, the Earth system models can't really calculate or get at is this climate sensitivity. And so we can kind of back calculate that from these big models. Um, and so how sensitive, at every degree change, um, how sensitive is the climate going to respond to that? Or, or not, how, for every radiant, how much, how much, how many, the concentration of gases in the atmosphere or the radiative forcing, um, how sensitive is that climate gonna be and how big of a temperature change Sorry, I originally said that backward. Um, so we use simple climate models to emulate the large-scale Earth system models. Um, we want this simple model to look like the Earth system model without having to run that Earth system model. Again, those take weeks to months to run. So we want something that'll look like that Earth system model but run really quick. So in order to do this, we calibrate parameters such as oceanic heat uptake, um, climate sensitivity, how fast the land warms in relation to the ocean, um, the ocean diffusivity, the transfer of heat down to the bottom of the ocean and back up, um, respiration on land. So there's a ton of parameters that we can kind of tune to match the large scale Earth system models. Um, so this is from um, the guy who really developed or, or is continuing to develop the magic model. Um, and so here's temperature change uh, versus year under three different scenarios in the different colored lines. And the dashed line is the Earth system model. Uh, and then the simple climate model is the solid line. And so we see that by changing those parameters, um, magic is able to uh, emulate those large scale Earth system models. Um, so you see all the solid line falls pretty much right on the dotted lines. Um, you can further break it up into the way the magic model operates is it has a northern and a southern ocean and a northern and a southern land component. And so we can see that in both of these, we're able to emulate the temperature in the northern land and, and uh, the, in the ocean. So again, we don't have to run those large scale Earth system models. We can just use the simple climate model and then make it look like those larger system models. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions? I'm just curious. Um, you said the magic model, a lot of people are using mm -hmm. it, um, but it's not well de documented and it's not open source. So, like, how does anyone have any faith in it? I mean, I guess it may have one or two key publications. And it's, so it's, it's, it's used a lot, and so there's a lot of studies that use it because it's kind of the only simple climate model out there mm -hmm. that, that, that can do this. Right. Um, and a lot of its users have kind of like, let's say, grown up with the model. And so they were trained to use the model, they went mm -hmm. off and trained somebody else. If you, and I, if you or I went to go pick up the model, we wouldn't, it, would, it would really be hard for us to understand that. Um, just the way it's, it's, it's written. Um, uh, and so, 
So we're, we're, we're hoping to kind of, with the new Hector model, reach a different audience of people that uh, can use it right off the bat, that they don't need to really be trained to use it. Um, and a lot of people understand certain aspects of the model, but not the whole model. Um, and uh, so. How, how, is, how is documentation of Hector? Since I've been developing, I think it's excellent. But uh, <laughs> we um, we have one we have one initial publication of it uh, that uh, that documents all of the equations. Okay. Um, and then if you go through the code, pretty much every line of the code is 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 commented of some sort. So you know exactly when you open up a section in our C code, <laughs> you know exactly what that section is doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know how kind of all of the components interact with each other. Um, and so it, it would still say, take some time to get up to date with it, um, but I think because our variables are named like temperature or uh, ocean carbon, you're able to understand, oh, that's ocean carbon and follow that, that variable. Um, in magic, it's a little less intuitive. Ocean carbon might be called AAA, and you're just like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't help me. So you really have to understand the model or, or, or know somebody that has used it a lot in the past. Um, so one of the things with Hector is we didn't even, we didn't recode magic. We kind of just said, you know what, we'll let that one, and we'll, we'll, and, we'll uh, and we'll do something new here with ours. Um, it still has a lot of work to do. There's a lot of things that we want to do with it to get it up to magic. It's been under development for 25 years or so. So Hector's only been under development for three. So there's still a lot of things that we would like to get, to get it to do um, that we're in the process of working on. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, so what else can simple climate models do? So we saw that they can emulate the large scale global climate of the Earth system models. Um, so we also use them for probabilistic climate projections. So any type of probability study that you're, you're, you, you're looking at, you need a lot of data. You need, for example, you need to roll that dice a hundred times, a thousand times to get the probability of how many times will you get heads. Um, and again, I've said this multiple times, that the Earth system models are computationally expensive, taking months to, months to run 100 years, not, not months to 100 years, but months to run a 100 year time period. Um, so therefore, we use simple climate models. And this is a really good example that I'm gonna show some studies from this. What is the probability temp global temperature change will stay below two degrees? Um, you've probably heard a lot about this, read a lot about it in kind of the newspapers. Uh, what's the chance that it'll, climate change will stay below two degrees? Uh, so this is coming out of the IPCC report. I mean, and it's a, it's a way of looking at the probability of staying below two degrees. Um, concentration of CO2, probability of, so you have 100% chance of staying below or no chance of staying below two degrees. The blue dots represent low CO2 cases. So let's say about 450 to 500 mm -hmm. ppm of CO2, and then your high CO2 cases up at about 800 ppm. And so if we want to stay below two degrees, um, we need to have a concentration of CO2 between 430 and 480. So coming in here, to have a, you know, a greater than 66 probability of maintaining a temperature change below two degrees throughout the century. So this is how we, we can, we go, okay, look, we need to cut CO2 emissions. We need to make sure that concentrations stay below 500 in order to uh, have climate change or, or global temperatures stay below two degrees. So we can also, this is just another way of looking at it, a little more, a little more complicated. Uh, we have radiative forcing here. This is our temperature increase above pre-industrial or temperature change. And then here is your CO2 concentrations. In the colored bars is the probability of staying below a certain temperature. So anything in the greens, you're very likely. It's a 95% chance of staying below. And then anything kind of on this side, you have a really low probability of um, staying below. So again, let's pick two degrees. What's the probability um, that we want to stay below two degrees? What do we need to limit our CO2 
concentrations to? What do we need to limit our radiative forcing to? So if we want to limit it to two degrees, CO2 levels need to be at about 415 ppm, um, or radiative forcing of about 2.1. And so we see that that falls in this range of 66, um, which is your, your likely, you're likely to stay below two degrees. Um, if you want to up that, and you want to say very likely, so something greater than 90% um, probability, then we follow this line here, so you would need something at like 375 ppm um, in order to have a 90% chance of staying below CO2, uh, two degrees. So one of the things we can also do with simple climate models is that we can look at uncertainty. Um, there's uncertainty at every along the whole process. So uh, there's uncertainty in our, emission, our emissions projections. There's uncertainty in our concept, how we calculate concentrations in the carbon cycle. Uncertainties then are radiative forcing, and then uncertainties then that, that all that uncertainty gets propagated into uncertainty in our temperature change. So we can use these simple climate models to look at kind of a spread of results, see what the uncertainty is. Um, um, this is from a study, and I won't get into all of the details, but essentially it's surface temperature change uh, versus year. Um, and this is calculated, this is using an integrated assessment model and the climate component that is magic. Um, and so the shaded area here, this kind of cone, represents that 66% probability or uncertainty range. Um, so if we have a, let's say this solid line is this immediate action plan. Let's take action now, let's cut our CO2 emissions, um, and uh, at five, you know, and end up at 550. Uh, you have this cone around it. So here's the median projection. Well, you could go as high as three degrees temperature change, um, even though your median comes in at like two and a half. So you have this cone of uncertainty uh, around those 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 projections. And um, this is showing rates of change. So how fast uh, will that will those changes occur? Um, so the rate of temperature change per decade. Um, and again, you can see that that shaded area on all of these different cases represents the 66% uncertainty range around that that median point. I think this is the paper I sent you guys. Um, which was really statistically based. Um, and I didn't realize that at the time. I was just pulling out that one figure for it. Um, so this combines both probability and uncertainty. Um, so again, here's this, let's limit temperature change to two degrees. Um, but how does that translate into allowable emissions? So that original, one of those plots, we had emissions to concentrations, to radio forcing, so uh, to temperature. So how can we tell, let's say, countries what they need to keep their emissions at in order to reach a two degree target? Um, how much can we emit to stay below that two degrees? And so what we need to do is we need to consider all of those uncertainties from all of, along all of those steps. Um, and so we can constrain our model <coughs> parameters to look like historical values. So we're starting our model off with something that matches historical va uh, values. Um, and we can also then emulate individual Earth system models. So we can look like historical, and we can also look like these large Earth system models. So, yeah. So here's our probability of exceeding two degrees, 100% chance, a 0% chance. Um, and here are our emitted, our emissions of carbon going, going from zero to uh, 2,500, gigatons of CO2. And then in the shaded area, the probability of staying below. So very likely up to very unlikely. So if we start with all of these little dots, they represent all of the different uh, climate models that we made. So we're using magic here. So we made magic look like all of these different climate models. Um, and then we ran magic uh, out um, uh, and decide and try to look at what's the probability of staying below two degrees. The black line represents the, the middle of all of those models. Um, 
So we can see that as we, uh, the, the more CO2 we emit, or the, the more, um, yeah, the, the more emissions we have out here, um, you have a you probability of exceeding two degrees, you have a 100% chance of exceeding <coughs> two degrees. So let's find, um, we want to, you know, let's keep it, keep it at 20% of exceeding. So we have a 20% chance of exceeding two degrees um, or an 80% chance of staying within two degrees. Um, then we would say, okay, we need to keep emissions, total emissions down to about a thousand gigatons of carbon. Um, and so this is really what we can use simple climate models for. Um, and then, um, uh, and then this, this bottom panel is, well, what would happen if we burn all available carbon resources? So uh, land use, gas, oil, coal, total fossil fuel reserves. Um, and it, we end up with 28 or 2,900 gigatons of carbon if we burn everything that, that the world has readily available. Um, and remember, if we wanted to have an 80% chance of staying within two degrees, we needed something at about 1,000 gigatons of carbon. Um, we're way over that, so we can't burn everything we have, um, or else we'll drastically exceed our two degree target. Okay, so then last about the climate models, I'm going to touch a little bit on IESM. Um, I think when Kate Calvin was here, I'm not quite sure, she may, she may have mentioned this. Um, so while we saw that the simple, simple climate models have numerous strengths and they can do a lot of stuff for us, um, they can't capture spatial and uh, relationships. I mean, they can't really look at variability. Um, Although this is something that we're really interested in investigating as we move forward and we're trying to figure out ways to do this. Um, but for the most part, the simple climate models just don't have this complexity. Um, and we can't look at variability and we can't look at kind of differences between, you know, all of these, these boxes. So something that Kate has been involved in is this thing called integrated earth system model. So it's where we're coupling GCAM to this NCAR model, <coughs> CESM, which is the community earth system model. And so at every time step, the human system and this really complex Earth system model are talking to each other. This is a figure of global agricultural yields. Um, the solid lines are uncoupled. So this would be, let's say, just running GCAM without a climate. Um, and then the dashed lines are coupled. So GCAM and this climate component from this complex Earth system model. So we can, we can, in GCAM, we can get the general trends, um, right, as in the solid lines, but we can't get the variability. And we notice here we have this peak and decline and then an increase again. And so that variability is coming from this, from this large scale climate models um, climate. Um, so they're saying maybe let's say in 2025, there'd be like a big El Nino. So that would change your, your yields. Um, so the GCAM in a simple climate model can get your overall trends, but they're not going to be able to pick up these changes in variability. Um, and so this is a big project a bunch of people are working on to uh, really look at the different, the different sectors um, and whether or not they should be coupled or not coupled, um, and how that variability in climate really influences um, different climates. Okay, so the last few slides and talk about some future climate impacts. So these aren't necessarily studies. Some are studies with uh, GCAM, um, and some are studies um, that you can do with this integrated assessment model and a simple climate model combined. So future climate change, we have changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, changes in heat. Um, around the world. And so we'll first start with water. So the oceans, the oceans are warming, it's redistributing heat around the oceans. Um, 
The oceans also we have to worry about sea level rise and ocean acidification. So these are things that we can look at um, with the, the IAM and a simple climate model. So I'm going to skip the heat for now, um, and I'm going to look at some, uh, sea level rise. So here we can look at probabilistic projections and estimate the amplitudes as well as the uncertainty around sea level rise, around the globe, and then around coastal areas. So this, this study um, uh, <coughs> tried two different methods of calculating sea level rise uh, out to 2100 under the four RCPs. And so here you can see that cone of uncertainty or that, or that spread of uncertainty around those projections. Um, so sea level rise can potentially get up to 170 centimeters um, under RCP 85. Uh, then we can use that information and also kind of look at coastal values. So how will, the, how will sea level change um, at different areas around the globe? Um, and so this is, this, is, this is important for population, um, uh, growth, economics, uh, things like that. If your sea level is rising, your coastal communities are going are gonna to have problems. Um, and so, uh, so we can use a GCAM and simple climate model to look at these feedbacks. Also in, on water, uh, ocean acidification. And this is something that I was, I'm really interested in. Um, and so in Hector, in this new simple climate model we're developing, um, we have the, the capabilities of calculating changes in the ocean carbonate system. Um, in particular, I'm interested in ocean pH. So the oceans are getting more acidic, the more CO2 that's added to the oceans. So here's a, here's a, a plot coming from Hector, uh, from the ocean. In red is the CMIP5 mean, so that's like the mean of all of these Earth system models. And then in blue is projections coming from Hector. So we fed emissions into Hector, and out, and out we get is ocean acidification or pH changes. Um, all of these other colored lines are observations from all, all over the place. Um, so this has just been submitted, and so I'm really interested in, in exploring this further and seeing how <coughs> we can um, kind of incorporate more of the oceans um, into GCAM in the future. Um, so then we have water, we have land water. Um, this is probably, you've seen this with Mohammed or something similar to it. Uh, so as climate changes, your water availability is going to change, your water quality, your water for energy, your water for crops, uh, any sorts of changes in precipitation, either in, in intensity or in locations of, of precipitation and evaporation will change. So this is highlighting that regions with water scarcity currently are going are, are, are gonna to get worse under this climate change scenario. Um, and so this is uh, between GCAM and Muhammad's water module with GCAM. There will also be climate impacts on crops. So uh, certain areas will benefit. They'll get warmer. They can grow more crops. Something, let's say, like, like Russia. Um, they might actually benefit from the, the warmer temperatures. So this is just a, a figure showing differences in, um, in average yields of corn, potato, rice, and wheat in 2050. And so we can see that in different areas, we have a loss of agriculture here, we have a gain of agriculture here. Um, and so this is something that you guys can look into with GCAM. Okay, how does you know, Europe compare to Australia? Uh, under, and how is, how is the agriculture changing? Um, a new study just came out, which I think is really interesting. This doesn't have this uh, wasn't conducted using GCAM, but it's something kind of similar that we could do with GCAM. Um, and um, so, so human health will be affected under climate change, um, and so all areas will be affected: cities, suburban areas, rural, mountains, plains, coasts will all have some effects of climate change. Um, and so a recent study found that this is in um, uh, the Southwest Asia, so Saudi Arabia, Yemen, um, found that future temperatures are expected to exceed this threshold for human adapt adaptability. So the idea is that um, adding humidity and temperature change together uh, will result in areas of the Southwest and Southwest Asia that we wouldn't be able to go out in 
And so they were saying that up to six hours a day in the summer, um, these areas would kind of be uninhabitable and you wouldn't be able to go outside. Um, so how does that then play a role in economics uh, and things like that? So everything is all, everything is connected with each other. Um, and so that's all I have for today. Assignments. <laughs> um, so okay, so this is. Um, I don't know how. I didn't know how. Was I? I didn't print it out or anything. It was just. I don't know. I can take. I mean, um, I'll get the slides from you. Yeah, sure. And then we'll post it. Uh, I'll okay. post and they can see this, so it's easy. Um, so in homework number one, I think you guys had a reference case uh, and a scenario case. So. Plot the global temperature versus year for all for those two scenarios, um, and plot the global radiative forcing. So you can query global radiative forcing, you can query global temperature change. Um, then pick two major forcing agents. So it's not only CO2 that influences the climate. So um, methane, aerosols, black carbon, organic carbon, uh, N2O, um, and then so I'm not 100% sure if all of these gases have radiative forcing associated with them. Um, so either pick the concentration or the radiative forcing um, for each of those forcing agents versus the scenario. Um, so let's say here's here's year and here's concentration, uh, and then here's your you know reference and here's your scenario. Um, and so out of those two forcing agents, which one has the greatest change between scenarios? another one um, uh, and so to kind of now look at like why why would those uh, forcing agents change um, you can plot the emissions of those forcing agents by sector so pick two sectors for those two forcing agents um, which sector changes the most and then can you kind of make any inferring any reasons as to why those sectors are changing so your mitigated scenario um, you're gonna let's say cut out totally cut out methane um, and because your agriculture changes or something like that so that's the type of, of uh, ideas that I wanted you guys to start thinking about it how changes in the sectors then kind of translate to changes in the climate system um, does that uh, does that seem doable oh, which mitigation scenario would you want um, I was just told that you guys had some stuff. We <laughs> have uh, four fifty ppm. So okay, is that enough to do RTP? No, the the four fifty. That is that from like homework number one. Yeah, yeah. You guys yeah, four fifty. So yeah, just one, use yeah. use whatever you have. That's already okay. you don't have to generate new scenarios or things like that. Um, four fifty would be roughly. I don't. Because that's four fifty concentrations, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Is that too easy? Do you guys, you guys want more plots? <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. Absolutely not. No, I have to do that. Well, the hard part is the inference, right? Yeah, sorry. The hard part is yes, the exactly. yeah, thinking yeah. part is yes. the inference. Yes. Um, I would just pick a region. So the climate variables are only going to come in as global. Um, so you can just do global sector. I mean, if you really want to get into it, go for, you can pick out the four of those major guys, but, um, yeah. Uh, and then these are just examples. So, so you can pick whichever ones you want. Um, if there's no change, like if both of your forcing agents have no change, or have no change in sector, try them. Um, <laughs> don't, don't shop with empty plots, no, there was no change. Um, so, so, uh, just, uh, just try another one. Your major ones are going to be like, you know, CO two and methane. But, but give an aerosol a shot and see what 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 changes. Um, I've never done this before, so it'll be interesting to see uh, the results coming out of it. So. Good. Sensible change. All right. Any questions? No. Well, thanks, Corinne. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robin. <laughs>